Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecil Chick, and I use female pronouns, she, her, and hers. Thank you for joining us for the third installment of the Titan Talk series, a uh, Titan Table Talk series, brought to you by the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity programs in partnership with alumni engagement in government and external relations. Today, our panelists will be engaging in the dialogue focused on civic engagement and advocacy in Native American and Indigenous communities, moderated by Dr. Jessica Stern. Before we get started with the program, I wanted to provide some Zoom housekeeping, housekeeping information. Um, first, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. So as a participant, you'll be muted and your camera will not be accessible during the program. Um, we will have a moderator that will lead us into a dialogue with our panelists today. If you do wish to ask questions or have any follow-up questions for our panelists, please utilize the Q&A function located in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Your question will be addressed in the last 20 to 30 minutes of the Q&A portion of our program. This dialogue will be recorded today and posted with closed captioning on the DIEP YouTube channel for everyone to enjoy. Finally, at the end of this program, please fill out the event feedback form that will be sent to all participants um, to the email that they use to register. If you enjoyed today's dialogue, please keep a lookout in the spring semester for the continuation of the Titan Table Talk series for Black History Month, Women's History Month, and APETA Heritage Month. To kick off our event today, I would like to introduce the President of Cal State Fullerton, Fran Vergie, to provide some welcome remarks. Thank you, President Vergie, for joining us today. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Cecil. Um, good afternoon. Um, happy Native American Indigenous Peoples Month, uh, and welcome to today's Titan Table Talk, uh, Civic Engagement and Advocacy in Indigenous Communities. I wanna begin by thanking our moderator, Associate Dean of Student Relations in our College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Jessica Stern, thanks Jess for doing this. I also wanna thank and welcome all of our panelists, uh, alumna Jen Oliveras, uh, alumna Ray Estrella, alumna uh, Reina Perez, and uh, Christina Snyder, uh, tribal advisor to Governor Newsom. Christina, we won't hold it against you that you're not an alum, but you are welcome to continue your lifelong learning with us anytime. We'd love to have you. Uh, once a Titan, always a Titan, and you start being a Titan today. And finally, I want to thank all of you for being here and being engaged in this critical conversation at this critical time in our history. You know, I'm honored to be here with you. And while I look forward to the day that we are back together in person, I'm pleased that we can be here virtually. Um, I'm grateful to the Titans who made this event possible. Uh, Cecil uh, mentioned some of those, especially our tremendous teams in our diversity, inclusion, and equity programs, our Office of Government Community Relations, our Office of Alumni Relations, and our Department of Information Technologies that makes all this happen. You know, as many of you know, before our campus decided to read the Book of Unknown Americans, our common read uh, for this year, there were a few other uh, equally worthy finalists in contention. Uh, and we shared all those possibilities with the campus. And one of the great things I got to do was read each of those books. One of those books, which is called entitled There, There by Tommy Orange, has a profound uh, quote and, an, and, and an, it had an impact on me um, that uh, when I read this quote, uh, stayed with me for a long time. And that quote is, if you were fortunate enough to be born into a family whose ancestors directly benefited from the genocide as or, and or slavery, maybe you think the more you don't know, the more innocent you can stay, which is a good incentive to not find out, to not look too deeply, to walk carefully around the sleeping tiger. Now, this time of year in particular, generations of Americans not only walk carefully and quietly around the sleeping tiger, they quite frankly, deliberately deny its existence. A few days ago, I wrote something that touches on what I mean by that. And with your uh, indulgence, I will share a portion of it here. Um, this is uh, from an article that I'm putting in the Orange County Register. As a newly minted immigrant with an East London accent, short pants and a Beatles haircut, and the name Framrose, I didn't exactly fit in immediately when I arrived in this country at the age of six. Everything was new to me, particularly the holidays. The first school year I learned about Valentine's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day, 
But my first November, when it came around uh, as an American, um, Thanksgiving came along and well, I was confused, I was lost. I, I couldn't process what they taught us in school, especially since the Native American stories that they were telling us in school didn't align with the Native American narrative that I saw on the television back then on shows like Bonanza and The Rifleman. Of course, I know now that both of those narratives are inaccurate, that both perpetuated racism and still do, and they, they both appropriated culture. But at the time, this narrative and others like it was served up to me and to my classmates and to countless others like uh, a tragic slice of Americana and that it was real and that it, and it is still done that way. Truth be told, it wasn't until we went to my grandparents' house for my very first Thanksgiving in the United States that I began to form sort of an understanding of the holiday Thanksgiving and that it began to kind of make sense. It began when my grandfather went out onto the front porch at the appointed time to announce that dinner was ready. He called it out to the entire neighborhood. I quickly realized that he wasn't just calling me and my, and my cousins out of the trees we were climbing. He was actually inviting and welping, welcoming everyone within earshot. And when no one appeared, he just kept calling until they did. I remember still that first year, uh, the answer to his shouted invitations began with an especially thin man in some tattered clothes who approached sheepishly from the street. After putting his arm around him uh, and welcoming into the house, grandpa kept calling and slowly more guests arrived, each appearing hungrier than the last and all adding to the diversity of folks sitting around our Thanksgiving table. Soon new seats were squeezed around the table, putting the gathering at you know, probably more than 30 people. Still grand, grandpa kept calling for more. And I whispered to my grandma, I remember I said, I, I said, there's no more seats grandma. And she said, that happens sometimes love. She, she just ruffled my hair and she said, grandpa will give up his seat if he needs to. Now as admirable as this annual tradition was at grandpa's house, and it was admirable, Grandpa's benevolence did not address America's ahistorical narrative uh, that we call Thanksgiving. In fact, back in 1967, no one even thought about what an ahistorical narrative was. I'm referring, of course, to the narrative that both disregards the uh, colonization of indigenous peoples um, and perpetuates the myth that this imperialism in our nation is that it, we are founded on is somehow uh, consensual rather than violently imposed. You know, nor did grandpa's gestures address the tradition of elementary schools across the nation telling a Thanksgiving story that portrayed Native Americans in a way that is historically inaccurate and at best and blatantly racist at worst. You know, that said, I have no doubt that grandpa would have stood tall against those injustices as he had been, had he been provided with the tools and the education to reach those truths. Yeah, he was a simple man living in a different time, but it was more than that. You know, he had been taught, as I have been taught in my new American school, and as many have been taught since, to tiptoe around the sleeping tiger. And as if we weren't tiptoeing around that tiger, uh, we were, if we weren't, we were outright denying its existence or changing its story to make us feel good, to make us feel better. All that said, grandpa's pre-meal tradition did show me that this time of year that calls upon us uh, to do things, uh, those who are born with privilege to examine that truth, to challenge the idea that our bounty has more to do with hard work and intelligence than an abundance of unearned opportunity that come too often at the expense of others. To express our gratitude for the blessings at our table by ensuring others that have equitable access to that table, even if it means giving up our own seat. Because when we actually do wake the sleeping tiger, it becomes clear that the seat, you know, that seat was never really ours to begin with. It was taken and often taken over and over. And it created a wound that is still yet to heal because we as a nation have too often shown little interest in a healing process. To once again borrow the words from Tommy Orange's There, There, 
the wound that was made when white people came and took all they took has never healed. An unattended wound gets infected, becomes a new kind of wound, like the history of what actually happened became a new kind of history. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time that we haven't been listening to are just part of what we need to heal. Let me just repeat that last part. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time, that we haven't been listening to, are just part of what we need to heal. But we at Cal State Fullerton must recognize that we, just like just about everyone else in this country, have played a role in perpetuating this travesty by not always listening, by not always telling the stories that need to be told, by not always lending our hand to heal the wounds that have been caused, by not acknowledging our contribution to the infection that has been created, by tiptoeing around so that we don't wake the sleeping tiger. So what to do? What to do? Well, the first thing we have to do is acknowledge, an acknowledgement of the truth of the false narrative under which we have lived for years and of the truth that history provides if we just seek it. Second, together, we can reaffirm our commitment to get better, to be better. Now that begins with acknowledging that the land we teach and learn upon was first inhabited by indigenous peoples who have stewarded this region for generations. It begins with the recognition that as occupants of this land in the territories of the Quiche, of the Tongva, of the Hashimen, we must honor these tribes with greater regularity and with reverence. It begins also with recognizing the more than 100 hundred other tribes that are historically tied to California. It begins with understanding and working to correct the inequities Native Americans face. Most recently, injustices further exposed by COVID-19 with disproportionate rates of infection among various tribes that have led to the tragic loss of many elders who carried invaluable traditions. It begins with events like this that aim to highlight the voices of those in our Native American and indigenous communities to better understand their lived experiences, including how those experiences relate to civic engagement and advocacy. As you all know, Native American communities face a high barrier to voting. And while there are some success stories, especially in this past election with the Navajo Nation turning out in record numbers in Arizona, we still have a long way to go. But again, that begins, that begins right here, right now with all of us as we intentionally wake the sleeping tiger until it roars forever and is heard everywhere. It's heard in our curriculum, in our classrooms, in our communities. So thank you. I look forward to this conversation. I look forward to listening and learning um, and honoring uh, the uh, indigenous peoples uh, on whose land we work and teach and live. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, President Virgie, for your words that serve as not just a call to action, but also the foundation for our dialogue today. To officially begin, I want to introduce our moderator. Dr. Jessica Stern is the Associate Dean of Student Relations for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and a professor of history here at Cal State Fullerton. She grew up in Northern California, earned her bachelor's in history from Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and her PhD from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She teaches courses on Native American history, colonial American history, and the American Revolution. Her first book, The Lives and Objects, Native American and British American Cultures of Production, Exchange, and Consumption in the Southeast from 1660 to 1763, argued that Southeastern Indians were not merely gifters, but utilized a range of economic modes that allowed for robust exchange with British settlers. Her second book project, which received a grant from the Huntington Library, is an intellectual biography of the founder of Rhode Island, Roger Williams, and father of religious toleration that argues that his interactions with Native Americans were key to his development. In her role as Associate Dean, she provides strategic leadership for the student, for the student success team and helps the college develop curricular priorities, such as the implementation 
of the AB 1460 Ethnic Studies requirement. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jessica Stern, everyone. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here and speak with our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much, Cecil, for arranging this talk. Thank you so much for, to President Virgi for setting the groundwork for this conversation. I'm particularly excited that our panelists range from social scientists to humanists and, and artists. As I hope will be clear in my opening comments, uh, these debates about sovereignty and citizen ship are often undergird by debates about identity and that identity is borne out in, in art and literature. Um, so do I wanna to get to the discussion that I will try to keep my comments as short as possible. I had to get rid of a lot of the details and I'm painting in very broad brush strokes to stay in time, um, but I am open to answer questions about specifics and some of the specifics, specifics will also come out in the questions. Okay. So one of the things I wanna do is talk about how this discussion about civic engagement and advocacy in Native American communities is a little bit different than some of the other discussions that have happened in this Titan Table Talk. Um, I'll also point out their similarities and President Virgi did a good job of, of showing how all of these issues wind together. Uh, but the first issue I wanna talk about is sovereignty. In order to understand the distinct history of Native Americans and their political struggles, we have to understand the consistent fight for tribal sovereignty. Unlike other groups the Titan series is delving into, whose predominant goal is to be included as equal citizens of the United States government, in addition to this, a major plank of Native American advocacy work is the unflinching argument that Native American tribes have a right to govern themselves on ancestral land. And what does this mean exactly? Sovereignty for tribes, it's usually the right to establish their own form of government, to determine membership requirements, who is a member of that tribe and who isn't, uh, enact legislation and establish law enforcement and court systems. Throughout history, there have been numerous challenges to this sovereignty. And throughout history, it was pretty much always community-based activism driven by indigenous communities and supported by allies in the judicial and legislative systems that forced the United States to respect self-determination and slowly by slowly return land. Because uh, these challenges really set the kind of the realms in which advocacy and civil and civic engagement take place, I, I wanna lay out some, what some of those challenges have been. First, depopulation of tribal lands, going back to the earliest moments of European colonization, disease, enslavement, and war, wiped out and diminished whole towns, whole communities. Languages were lost, rituals were left without specialists, histories were left without historians. Uh, this wasn't across the board, disease hit um, unequally in some areas over, over, over others, but I do wanna point out that a lot of advocacy work is based on rebuilding these very basic building blocks of polities with language and culture, art, philosophy. Number two, federal and state governments have sought to remove whole tribes from their land, terminate tribal governments and common property rights, relocate Native American individuals off of tribal land through the use of boarding schools, adoption policies, relocation programs, usually because these tribes were seen as an impediment to governmental expansion economic interests. Three, there have also been legal challenges that grow out of very, very complicated issues of whether criminal and civil crimes perpetrated on tribal land should be tried in tribal, state, or federal courts, and whether federal regulations bind tribes. So for the last 70 years, the norm has been to accept tribal sovereignty in principle, though the limits to that sovereignty have been up for debate. Furthermore, the lands held by tribes and the population living on tribal land has been significantly diminished prior to the middle of the, of the 20th century. 23% uh, of Native Americans in the United States live on tribal land and 77% currently do not. The second thing I really want to emphasize, and this is where I'm so glad we have our humanists and artists here, is how central the public presentation of identity through clothing, regalia, art, philosophy has been to tribal rights and citizenship rights. 
throughout history, uh, tribal recognition has relied, at least in part, on the tribe's ability to prove to governmental officials that it's still authentic, that it's tied to a pre-contact version of itself. This is really complicated because usually the source base for determining authenticity are these very early European documents that we now know unreliably characterize Native American communities. Um, but oftentimes, tribal recognition was had to be borne out by a separateness, right, of the proof that 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 tribes are different than Americans. But on the flip side, Native American full acceptance as American citizens for much of the 20th century relied on the opposite, the willingness of Native Americans to shed that identity and assimilate to Euro American culture. Though Native Americans were conferred with US citizenship in 1924, until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, many state laws required Native Americans to, prove, to, to not appear Indian, to kind of denounce their, their, their Indianness in order to fully participate as American citizens. Thus, what we have here is um, a historical tension between US citizenship and tribal citizenship. And slowly by slowly, we're trying to like dismantle this, this tension, um, but the ghosts still haunt us today. This tension is heightened by the fact, and, and President Vergy really underlined this, but you know, heightened by the fact that Native American culture has such an intimate place in the foundation of American identity. And this is from the very beginning. And this entanglement creates a unique context for Native American activists and artists. Key thinkers in American history from Roger Williams to Ben Franklin have painted this idealized picture of Native Americans to shame and inspire Americans. Um, a little more recently, uh, think of the crying Indian in the Keep American Beautiful public service announcements in the 1970s, again, where this idealized image of the Native Americans are, 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 is set up to, to shame Americans. And then we have other American leaders like Thomas Jefferson, who invoked the image of the savage Indian to defend American independence. So we have a situation in which there's a very particular image of Native Americans that's seared on the American psyche, leaving, with Na leaving Native American individuals with a constrained stage on which to operate without being judged, rendered invisible, or um, in invalid. A quick story, and then I'm gonna introduce our, our panelists. Um, I had the pleasure of living in Baltimore when the National Museum of the Native American Indian opened in DC in 2004. I was teaching my first class, my students and I, we followed the news coverage. We, we, we went to a very early um, opening and I was really struck by the, the journalists who covered the opening and how they gawked that the individuals in traditional regalia had the audacity to mess with that image by using cell phones. Because so reliant has the American psyche been on a particular vision of Native Americans that's frozen on time. To combat this perceived tension between modernity and Native American individuals, the museum dedicated the top floor to an exhibit that showed Native American individuals living and working in contemporary urban environments. In the entry hall, I have this vivid memory, you would walk through the hall on either side of you, there would be kind of holograms. And some were apparently uh, Native American individuals. And then in front of you, there was a big caption. Anywhere in the Americas, you could be walking with a 20th century Native American. This question has been asked in past table talks and will undoubtedly be asked in future ones. How does one respect and portray one's identity and be respected as an American citizen? With that, I want to start by um, introducing our panelists. First, our social scientists. We have Christina Snyder, who is an enrolled member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. She has a BA in history and a JD, both from UCLA. She currently serves as tribal advisor to Governor, to Governor Gavin Newsom and executive secretary to the Native American Heritage Commission. Prior to serving in this role, Christina has a storied career in law, including to name a few things, serving as a law clerk 
in the Office of Tribal Justice at the United States Department of Justice and the Wallapai Court of Appeals and working as a staff attorney at the National Congress of American Indians. Next, Ray Estrella, who is a proud Titan alumnus who holds a BA in sociology and an MS in counseling. Ray is a registered American Indian with the Pasqua Yaqui tribe of Tucson, Arizona. He currently serves as an in-home outreach counselor with the Southern California Indian Center. In his role, he focuses on helping high-risk American Indian mothers. On to our humanists and artists. Reina Perez is of the Zapotec peoples of Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, she has a BFA from CSUF in graphic and interactive designs. During her time at Cal State Fullerton, she was the social media coordinator for Intertribal Student Council. And I'm sure we have a lot of intertribal people in the audience who are very pleased to see Reina again. Reina is very passionate about creating visibility for Southern Mexi Mexican indigenous groups. And she's the owner of Reina Chabeli Designs, where she sells art geared toward the Oaxacan community. Last but not least is Jen Olivares, who is an enrolled member of the Juanino Band of Mission Indians. She holds a musical theater degree from CSUF. She has worked with Amerinda, which is New York City's only Native American producing entity. She is one of the first Native actors to perform at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which means a lot to me because I spent my childhood making that drive up to Ashland to, to see the, the Shakespeare uh, Festival presentations. Uh, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, she played the first two-spirit character in the world's first LGBTQ production of Oklahoma. As an artivist that fuses activism and theater, Jen has worked and is working on multiple projects that decolonize theatrical spaces. So now we get to the main event. We get to engage our panelists in discussion. Um, the first thing that I would like to ask Christina Snyder to do for the group, if you don't mind, is um, could you describe the current relationship between tribal governments and the state of California and the federal government? In what ways are tribal nations sovereign and what are the major ways that that sovereignty is curtailed? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Is everything okay? I had to call in because, okay, good. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm joining you from the ancestral homelands of the Patuan peoples up here in West Sacramento. And you just gave me a very complicated question. So I will try to answer it the best way I can. Um, but really, um, the relationship between um, tribes in the state and tribes in the feds, um, it really should be kind of a series of overlapping circles where you have, you know, different jurisdictions engaging with each other in different ways. And in some spaces, that is how it works. In other spaces, it kind of breaks down. Um, here in California, we have uh, a little bit of a complication because of this thing called Public Law 280, and I'll kind of um, expand a bit on everything I'm saying right now so that you have the context, but um, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, which was a really wonderful overview of how sovereignty works here in the United States and, and what it means and, and how, you know, it, it, it pre-exists uh, the United States, it pre-exists the Constitution, Tribes were here first, um, in case you didn't know, now you know. Um, and so a lot of the foundational relationships um, that we see um, play out today in a lot of complicated ways are because of treaties that were made um, by other foreign parties prior to the existence of the United States. So um, when the English came, when uh, the French came, when the Spanish came, they dealt with the Cal sorry with the the tribes in the United States as sovereign entities um, that they would make treaties with in order to get you know mutually beneficial terms. So for example, it started with you know we won't attack you or we'll help you get some food, and it ended with we'll take all of the land and we'll give you healthcare, education, other things in perpetuity. Um, certain areas of land that you can have in perpetuity. How that played out, as you can see now. Um, was not always um, a uh, mutually beneficial or um, folks keeping up their end of the promise. Um, but again, it's, there's that uh, foundational principle that um, tribes from the beginning have been dealt with as um, nations. Um, 
how that has evolved is, you know, based on kind of a series of laws and interpretations and things that um, have not always worked in favor of tribes. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, but um, basically, the Constitution um, has been read to give Congress the, the ultimate authority over tribal affairs. And um, how Congress has dealt with that has changed over time, depending on what its approach to Native peoples is. So um, first, um, you know, it started with, you know, authorizing treaties with certain tribes as um, as the feds expanded westward it became more about how do we deal with this issue of having people on these lands that we want um, or that our constituents want and so as you get closer and closer to california you have a more termination policy which means terminating the sovereign existence of tribes not and in some cases, actually, um, you know, committing genocide to accomplish that. But really, when we talk about termination, it's about terminating the legal status of tribes as governments. So um, uh, once you get to California, you have kind of a history that it goes back and forth between the best way to accomplish this, whether it's through relocation and genocide, whether it's through cultural genocide, whether it's through um, boarding schools and adoption, um, or whether it's through just giving people land and saying that you don't get to be a government anymore. So we have this like checkerboard approach of how um, the federal government wanted to deal with this. And then finally, they said, hey, state, we're kind of tired of dealing with this. We're going to pass this law called PL 280 that gives you criminal jurisdiction and certain other jurisdiction over tribes that we would otherwise have as Congress. So Congress retains that jurisdiction in other places in the United States, but in California, it's a bit strange because what they did is they've now created this actual three-part um, jurisdictional um, craziness, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, over tribal populations in California. Um, how it works in modern times um, is that we've kind of all had to come to this place where you know tribes are not going anywhere the state doesn't seem to be going anywhere the feds kind of just want things to not be on their plate anymore so we've had to kind of work out what this um mutual cooperative uh, cooperative looks like um and that has worked um well in some ways and not so well in other ways um and i'll i'm talking too much so i will wrap up in a second but um uh my role is really um kind of a, a key part of that. So the Office of the Tribal Advisor was established by Governor Brown in 2011, and it was to create better mutual relationships with tribal nations throughout the state. Um, and so really what my role serves is to, it's almost a domestic diplomacy role within the state of California to link those connections with the feds, but then also with the tribal nations in the state of California. So where we have um, mutual um, issues of collaboration, we can work together to get those things addressed. So like, for example, um, when the feds uh, passed PL 280, they also didn't really pass on a lot of funding. And that all kind of, you know, was fell through the gaps. Um, so if there are areas where tribes are not getting what they need based on the trust responsibility of the of the United States, um, we can be a good ally in getting them there. Um, uh, conversely, uh, tribes have this flexibility to work with the United States when the state is being awful and not, you know, living up to its um, obligations to provide law enforcement on tribal lands, for example, leading to things like missing and murdered indigenous peoples. So um, that's a long answer for a very complicated thing. Um, but really, we all work best when we're all working together and going in the same direction. And so really, um, right now we're in kind of this sweet spot um, and, and people can feel free to disagree where the state is listening. We've now got an administration that is possibly going to be aligned with this work. And we've got tribes that are seeing the mutual, the benefits of mutual cooperation with the state um, and the feds. And so we've got a really key opportunity here for tribes to really get a lot done and to hold the state and the feds to their promises. Um, I think that answers your question in a roundabout way, but happy no, to that was that was perfect. Thank you so much for giving us that California context that I am not able to give. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn to some of our other panelists now that now that we have some of the framework of you know United States history, California history. 
What are the issues in your minds that have had the most impact among Native Americans and indigenous communities in the past decade? And how does this history from your perspective inform what issues impact those communities now? Everybody's being so polite. Anybody wanna jump in and go first there? Jump in. I'll jump in. Oh. Whoever goes, I'm, I thought we were going in order or something. I wasn't sure. Okay, am I good or? Yeah, Raina, please okay. go. So uh, to that question, um, my perspective is um, of course different because I am from an indigenous group from south of the border. And um, although we don't, uh, we're not federally recognized by the Mexican government um, historically, uh, we do still um, have a lot of indigenous groups who uh, still continue to practice their traditions uh, we still speak our languages and um, we continue to have sovereignty in our own ways. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, what I've noticed is that uh, one of the biggest issues that has affected me as a you know person who is from south of the border is uh, language loss. And um, language loss is happening because of uh, migration. Um, the way these two are linked is, you know, from the uh, villages we're from, uh, we don't have access to resources. Uh, we're from very marginalized villages. <laughs> Sorry, your daughter's so cute. <laughs> um, we're from very marginalized villages and um, we don't leave our communities because we want to. You know, we like, we're, um, we grow in multi, multi-generational homes. So I grew up with my grandparents, with my great grandparents and um, you know, it's expected that um, I would have, you know, gotten married there and like had my kids and like have my parents help me raise my kids as well. But um, what happens is that, uh, you know, people want a better life. And you know, when there's no running, when there's no running water, there's no like um, education past middle school, a lot of parents seek to either go to bigger towns or go to bigger cities. Or in my family's case, you know, come to a whole different country, you know, Oaxaca is like really down south of the border um, towards uh, the south of Mexico. So coming from point A to point B, it wasn't just like a location change, but it was also a, a shift in time change because my parents didn't just come from um, one city to the next, but they came from a place that still, you know, uses uh, firewood to cook like breakfast, like an egg in the morning, you're gonna use firewood. Um, to go get, to drink, um, get drinking water, you're going to go to the well, that's like a mile away. So it was like, um, just a change in like location. And, uh, I talked to my parents about this, but also time, I feel like they traveled a hundred years ahead when they moved to the United States. So, um, with language loss, what happens is that my parents didn't want to teach me stuff that was my first language compared to them because they didn't want me to have an accent while I spoke Spanish. So, you know, they thought um, that Spanish was going to benefit me more here in the US because they needed a way to communicate with me, of course. And then I learned English in school. But what happened there is that um, when they would speak Zapoteco, I didn't know what they were saying. Like, I would just hear like a bunch of gibberish. And it wasn't until I moved back to Oaxaca, I lived there from ages 10 to 16, that I learned how to speak Zapoteco because I was around it. Um, my family members would speak to me. I would start to make the connection with words to objects or phrases to like actions. And now luckily I understand it. And, um, you know, I can communicate with my grandparents. I can communicate with like my people. And honestly, if I didn't know, language, I would probably have had a bigger identity crisis than what I already had. And that was me living in a village, knowing my language, talking to my elders on a regular, and I still had to go through the identity crisis of, am I indigenous enough? Like, like what, what is it to be indigenous? Am I not just Mexican? I never felt Mexican. I don't feel Mexican because people in Mexico don't see me as Mexican. So. Um, language loss and uh, you know these issues with identity have definitely been um, 
the biggest issue that I can see from my perspective and what's happened in my community because um, yeah, there's the village is getting smaller. We went from uh, 200 and uh, from 120 kids in 2010 to 60 kids in the whole village in 2020. So, you know, it's like, it's kind of hard to say it's like one issue, but it's a lot of issues linked together. So language is being lost because we're going all over the place, leaving our communities. Therefore, a lot of us are having like a bunch of identity crises. Um, so to that point, it's, you know, uh, before I continue, I'm glad I'm here with everyone and um, I'm really excited to hear what everybody has to say. Thank you so much. That was a lovely answer. And in particular, I think that you hit it all of the, the dimensions that language, language is not only a carrier of culture, but it's a builder of, of community, right? And, and I think on that point, I could see either going to Jen or Ray, but Ray, do you mind me asking you to come in? Because I know in your community support work, you might be seeing similar issues that Reina described or, and maybe slightly different issues. The thing is, is that, hi, hello everyone, um, everybody, was relocated out of the tribes. And so we're all, there's so many different tribes that are all spread out across LA County and across the whole pretty much state. You, you, you look hard enough, you will find them. And you, you, I mean, I, I, work with, I work with five different nations here. I have five different coworkers that are all from different places. And it's just, um, it's hard because everybody's so spread out it's hard to, you know, especially during this time of COVID, you know, we're used to having powwows. We're used to, there's usually one every week. Normally ours would be um, this, this weekend for SCIC. And um, just the lack of visibility, I want to say, the lack of visibility, poverty, you know, the history, <laughs> like Thanksgiving, you know, when my daughter learns, we, we go over there and we kind of, you know, bring a few Indians and, uh, we, uh, we, sh we show them, you know, and they just kind of look at us <laughs> like we're different. <laughs> so it's just a lot of the stories and a lot of the history that they're being told is just different. It's not right, it's not the same. So did I answer your question? No, that's, thank you so much. And I, that's a great segue to the work that Jen does. Jen, do you want to come in here and, and talk about how, how you, um, what you see as the major issues? Yeah, um, I think when I first read this question, I, I immediately, you know, um, read, first of all, Mia Mahatam Notang Jen. Hello, everyone. I am Jen. Um, I'm a Hashiman, a uh, member of the one in Uganda Mission Indians uh, located in um, San Juan Capistrano, just a little bit south of Latunga, which was the village that um, is closest to the current Cal State Fullerton campus. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I think when I first read this, I immediately went to language. I went to um, you know, uh, visibility in those ways. But I, I think if I'm gonna stem into like the deepest issue that I think it's just the consistent erasure um, over many, many centuries and the kind of a pass the ball um, of colonization between the Spanish colonizers into um, uh, when Mexico owned um, California and then now um, through the federal government. So um, reaching outside of uh, the native community into actual tribal names and places will really allow um, the issues that are very specific to these communities to be um, brought to specific light. Um, like for as many um, as like days in, in the year, there are that many tribal nations, federally recognized, unfederally recognized, non-federally recognized in this country. Um, I think saying something has this issue as the most impact erases in a way tribe specific needs and inherently ignores the complexities of the native diaspora, especially in California. It's such a, con as, as Ray said earlier too, there we've got, he's got five people that he works with all over and um, you know, through relocation and you know, genocide, both cultural and literal. Um, it's the erasure that, um, contributes to these issues um, in the modern and modern times now. Um, so I think authentic, valid representation in the communities and on the land that we've been living on for centuries um, would uh, avoid, uh, avoid us from continuing to be considered monoliths, which is the kind of the uh, academia word that I've been seeing thrown around quite a bit these days. Um, 
being that we're native people are all one entity when in, in specific in, when when in actuality we are you know comprised of hundreds of sovereign nations that all have um, languages cultural practices that a lot of the time they're homogenized um, out of necessity and out of you know just the way that that's what that's where our migration patterns were but um, yeah I, it does blend in so the thing I wanted to I guess finish with this was you know, what's the most impactful issue to the Kanaka Maoli? Is it the telescope at Mauna Kea? Is uh, the Kumeyaay um, south of, you know, of my band, um, uh, they certainly believe that the des desecration of their sacred burial lands at the so-called border wall is their most important issue right now. Um, the Navajo Nation had the highest rate of COVID-19 infections per capita above New York for a certain part of this entire pandemic. So these issues cannot be just saying like, native people need, uh, need this. Um, we need visibility and we need specificity to our land and to what our individual tribal needs are. That's, I guess it. Thank you so much. I think that's a incredibly, incredibly important point. Uh, Christina, do you want to add, from your perspective, do you want to add any other issues that, that you see as being really critically important right now that haven't been mentioned before I go to the next question? Sure. And I think that everyone hit it really well. I really liked what Jen just said, because I think that what I see from my perspective, too, in policymaking is kind of a laziness, honestly, about figuring out Native people and their needs and understanding that even within tribes, there's a lot of individuality and, and dissent. And um, I feel like this is not just unique to tribal nations or tribal citizens or Native people or Indigenous people. I think it's kind of a broader sense of, you know, the dominant culture wants things to be easy and digestible, but they're not. And that's the fault of the dominant culture. And so <laughs> it's it's upon them to kind of sort out the complexity and the diversity that is resulting from their actions, not on the, you know, the victim culture to explain that necessarily. But when the victim culture does choose to explain it, you need to listen and you can't say, got it, I'm gonna go fix it without any native people at the table. Um, and that, I, so that was just a thought on what was just said. But um, in general, what I'm hearing from native communities, at least in California is, um, you know, a drive to reclaim space. Um, so that's, you know, um, both the invisibility issues, but also, um, you know, this is the ancestral homelands of so many different nations and peoples and practices. And, um, you know, the state and the people who live here now pretty much are ignorant of that, um, which at this point seems to be by choice. Um, and so I think um, what I'm hearing, the bigger drive is, is you know, reclaiming space, both, you know, uh, stewardship, ownership, occupation, um, and, and just re-indigenizing, for lack of a better term, these places that um, have lost that character and are, are suffering from it. Thank you. Um, you are all invited to this panel because of the work that you do in advocacy and civic engagement. And so I want to now turn the question to give you a chance to, to talk about how you in your own personal life, your own professional lives have started approaching and chipping away at some of these larger issues that we have talked about. Um, anybody would, was there anybody who is pressing to talk on this one? Talk, you're all doing amazing stuff. I know from your, your bios. So I would love to hear um, how you're making the connections, Jen. I feel that my um, contribution to this question is going to be a little bit different than the others on the panel. And so I want to maybe just like, you know, artificially separate a bit because uh, my civic um, engagement and my advocacy work is a little bit different um, from, um, you know, boots on the ground and which I do partake in as well. Um, but, you know, I was, um, alum, what's up Titans, how's it going? Um, I've been a theater professional for 10 years and um, for most of my most of, most of of my career has been um, in, in this lane that I'm in now, but in the beginning um, I was trying to stay in the lane of artistry um, that was, I felt available to me. And I mean, this is no shade to 
my wonderful alma mater, but you know, 2012 at CSUF was a different world in terms of what we thought we could put on stage and what, what kind of people could be seen as performers. And so um, there wasn't the, the best track record with uplifting um, black indigenous people of color's voices within the theater department. So I know it's changing now, so let's go. Um, but my advocacy work in my profession began around 2017. Um, when I became kind of like the go-to um, native mezzo soprano in New York City for these uh, developmental um, musical theater sphere and theater sphere. Um, and I was introduced to native theater through an amazing uh, company called Amarindo, which was a reference in my bio, um, which had a team of native directors, designers, producers, script consultants, musicians. So I was in this like fairy tale world of like, we make native theater, it's for us, it's with us, it's by us, and this is how it's all going to be. Um, I had some very fairy tale expectations. So I, what was when I was offered these jobs and brought into other creative productions that had native characters in them, I realized that just because I was getting to play a native character in a contemporary piece of work did not be, mean that I would be regarded as a contemporary native human in a room. Um, and I had to begin fighting for authentic um, representation and so many other things. And unless I was comfortable being part of these productions where um, Native peoples were written in as stereotypes or plot points um, or tropes, I was going to have to use my voice outside of the traditional role of, you know, grateful actor. So I think that's when I kind of started, you know, seeding my like mini activist role in um, the theater and entertainment industry. Um, I became the like my self-taught actor, dramaturg, cultural consultant for every piece that I was on. Um, I constantly made people mad. <laughs> I'm consistently making people mad with my questions. I consistently, I guess, like insult middle-aged white men who have obsessions with the Wild West by just like asking questions like, hi, do you have any idea where this takes place? Cause I'd like to maybe get a tribal affiliation or like, it would be great for the design team as well. I don't know. They can't answer me these questions, mouths agape. So I just started being this, um, I just started to be this voice in these rooms um, and it, it, it has allowed me to, you know, now be kind of brought on for these projects as a, a cultural consultant or at least um, to connect um, my network with a proper um, native, um, wherever, what, whatever tribe the, um, the piece actually takes place upon or whose culture we're consulting, I, I can kind of be the the liaison between like allowing people to be culturally humble when in regards to putting native people in their pieces um, or even just writing land acknowledgement type things because there's a lot more that we need to be doing than acknowledgements. It does not stop there. Um, but um, for now, I choose pretty much exclusively to work on native work by native creatives. Um, though I am willing, I do consult with the right theater companies who I do believe are culturally humble towards these things and um, can, can begin to present our people outside of leathers and feathers in the way that um, a lot of, well, all of <laughs> mainstream media has typically, and is still continuing to. I mean, we've got some amazing things that are on the docket and are being filmed and produced right now that is very good, authentic representation of native peoples, but yeah, it's an uphill battle and I'm, that's what I do with my work. Thank you so much. Um, Raina, I'm gonna ask you to speak next because I know that you, you're you also doing this work at least partially in the artistic realm. Yeah, hi. Uh, okay, so uh, I agree with what Jen said when it comes to like this whole idea of a monolith. Uh, like she said, I've been like hearing this term going around a lot and um, the term also pan-Indianism where it's like, we're just like clumped up in this kind of group and you know, people outside of like the, I guess, native community think we maybe share like the same practices or like share the, uh, the same um, regalia when in reality, even communities who are like an hour or 30 minutes apart can like, you know, share different like, like uh, use different things for their like cultural practices. Um, a lot of my work came from the idea of not wanting to, see have people see um because i'm from the zapotec peoples i didn't want people to think that zapotec was equivalent to um the mainstream media idea of what an aztec looks like so what happens a lot in mexico with misrepresentation is that um 
people know about Aztecs like all around the world. Like when they think Aztecs, they think Mexico. But what happens there is that um, the erasure of like a lot of indigenous groups in Mexico, you know, get lost. We're not um, seen as like, um, you know, they see us like with these like feathers and like these, um, you know, um, what else? Like these like, uh, they relate us to these deities that aren't like from other indigenous groups. So what I do is uh, to capture, I guess the differences is uh, a lot of photography. I like to go to my community in Oaxaca and capture everyday life. I like to uh, capture my grandma um, doing like, you know, her laundry or just having a cup of coffee. And um, also like, you know, hang out with like my cousins and stuff like that, capture them uh, embroidering because over there embroidery is very common. I like to capture them doing things because my issue is that it's always, you know, these communities seen as poor and struggling and like, you know, so marginalized. And although we are that in some way, you know, we also have dreams, we have aspirations. You know, I hear this phrase a lot, like from either people here in the US or in Mexico, like, oh, indigenous people are so happy with so little. And it's like, no, that's a lie. Like, you know, we have to work with what we have, but we also like nice things too. We also like, you know, we see the television in the villages where, you know, we see people like with all these like gadgets and stuff. So um, yeah, that's mainly what I do with my photography. Uh, when it comes to my art, I do like to create a visual representation for Oaxacan people because I feel like um, art focused uh, to specific indigenous groups does create more of, um, is more empowering to somebody's identity rather than like um, just creating some, I guess, feather design that can go for any indigenous group. Thank you so much. Um, and Ray, I would love to hear your answer to this question about how your personal and professional experience have helped link your civic engagement to your advocacy work. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> a lot of the families that we uh, deal with are literally straight from the reservation and they have no, um, no other means. And um, some of the families, in order to get help, um, they have to show their card from a lot of, the, there's different places like TANF you know, that where they can get um, TANF is temporary assistance uh, for needy families. And if you're, if you show your card, you can get help and they, you know, give you a small stipend each month. And I think we have to start from the bare roots first and start educating them because right now everybody's in emergency mode. So it's kind of hard to talk, you know, civic until we get food on the table, rent paid off the streets, stuff like that. So, yeah, <laughs> and most of, and I deal with about 12 to 13 different moms and all their stories are all pretty much similar. You know, they have, you know, children and the dads are gone and, you know, we need to get help. So I think of um, when we talk about the census, the census is not really true to the numbers. Because with when um, we're trying, because with our with our grant here, they said our numbers were super low. No, there's over about I want to say there's a close to three hundred thousand in Los Angeles County of different tribes. I mean, of different you know people belong to tribes. You know, there's a lot of the Navajo Navajo Nation, you know, in LA. But there's there's so many different so many different tribes in LA, and it is just very overlooked. So I think that's where we need to start because the census, when we try to get the, that help, it doesn't, it's not there. So did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, okay, I hope y'all don't hate me for this, but I am gonna ask a question that's not on the list, but <laughs> I, I, I would benefit from the answer. And I, I think that, that this, isn't, this is something the university has to talk about. Um, what is our role 
as a university to help uh, work towards these these issues? What do we need to do better? Jen, you mentioned um, who we're allowing on our our stages, right? Like what what kind of curriculum do we need? What kind of other support? should the university be partaking in? This is kind of a, a time where, where it can be a, a call to action. We're at a moment, right, with the passing of AB 1460 and the ethnic studies requirement that maybe we really can start thinking more about curriculum and, and our place in these issues. Well, you know, there's a lot of work to, uh, to, um, to correct. Um, in terms of the American schooling system, glorifying cultural and literal genocide. Um, don't even get me started about how the buck gets passed between, oh, those were the French, that was the French's fault. We're not really gonna study about this. So I think um, as a university, Cal State Fullerton, um, understanding who the land belonged to and who has been caretaking this land for thousands of years as a student coming in would have been an amazing thing but outside of just knowing my history my life and my family and my truth um, that could have been a great thing to have um, across the board like I said land acknowledgments are nice but um, I do feel like a lot of the education towards the original caretakers of the land type stuff stops at like missions, uh, California missions, and then it's like, eh, and then messy, 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 and then now we've got a weird diaspora of 300,000 Native Americans in California, and none of them are signing the census right, we don't have the right numbers, and you know, so a basic education on contemporary Natives within Southern California, I think could really contribute to eradicating that, like just general erasure that is, I think people don't ever assume that California has Native Americans in the first place. It's a very strange thing to say. Um, at, at being a California Native and realizing that people don't even know that we exist. So yeah, in a, in a contemporary landscape, it would be a great way to um, show that we are here, we have been here and not just stopping at, and this is how we used to make acorn mush. You know, that's usually where these things end. Um, so continuing. Thank you, Raina, Ray, you were both students here. Um, so either speaking from that perspective, being a student here or or from your professional existence after or, or other thoughts, any any suggestions you want to make to Cal State Fullerton? I remember there was a group and uh, they had a, a back when I was there, I want to say 2005, they had a group and, and they had a meeting and I went and there was one person there <laughs> and I, I just felt it was so un, underutilized and not promoted so I, I i wish that they could you know if you if you find the right people you can you can promote a powwow you can promote outreach all those kinds of things you know ucla has their their annual powwow every may during mother's day and it's a huge thing long beach has been doing it for 50 years and they have their one of the biggest powwows ever so I think it's just the right, you know, reaching out, talking to the right people, and we can promote it and educate people better. Thank you, Raina. Do you would you feel comfortable weighing in on this? Yeah, of course. Um, I think what CSUF in particular needs to do um, is listen and support to what Native students want and what and not what they think native students want. So with Intertribal, I loved being in that group because of the support group we had. Luckily, uh, Raymond, we were a group of like seven this time. I mean, it wasn't like that many more, but like, you know, we were like seven really committed students, like literally working around the clock to make this group work. And mind you, we're, we're just a club. You know what I'm saying? Like, I guess I can't lie and like say that Cal State Fullerton has been really supportive of native students because honestly it hasn't like there in no way that I feel like we were fully supported as a club we don't have a resource center we share like a really tiny room um our couches are probably like 30 years old they've been there since the 70s um 
And, you know, we don't have native staff, um, uh, native um, not staff, um, tenured staff, I think it's called. I think we only have one. And so honestly, we really didn't even have faculty to help us out. Like when we would organize these events, you know, we only had like Rosalina helping us out or Deborah, who was always helping us out, finding ways to like get us grants and stuff like that. But I would definitely say it's, you know, listen to what we need because, um, you know, as time changes in a, in a school, like the necessities are going to be different. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah, we just, uh, it's a lot to like say right now, but we really didn't feel as supported. And a lot of us got burnt out trying to make these events happen. And, um, you know, I just wish we would have, you know, in my time there from 2017, I think, to um, this year, beginning of this year, um, I wish I would have seen like a Native American Resource Center where there was people that were um, paid to do like this outreach um, uh, program to like high school students because we had to do the outreach as a club, take our time out of our day to like organize and contact these high schools, be like, hey, like, um, you know, come to Cal State Fullerton, uh, we'll talk to our people here, you know, try to get some, uh, like, some free food for y'all, but, you know, just come check the campus out. Um, and like Christina said earlier with the government, you know, like, it is like, it just feels like the, uh, the school is just really lazy, like, like, what, why haven't there been these outreach? Why is our room so beat up? Why don't we have a Native Resource Center? You know, we need to like find ways to, um, like you know, Jen and uh, Jen said earlier. You know, find ways to make uh, have Native American classes come back to campus, and like you know, and show like the traditional aspect, but also like the contemporary. Aspect. That way, people like don't just keep this like um, stereotypical image in their mind. Thank you, and I'm glad that I asked the question. I am listening. I, I think that the other administrators on this call are listening too, and, and I vow to do better. Um, it makes me, if I, it, if I can say, it does make me remember when the Senate was on the verge of passing a Land Acknowledgement Act, and I met with, with Chase, who was then still a student here and still on intertribal, and he presented the uh, work that um, he as part of ASI and also Intertribal did, uh, which show, which going back to Jen's comment, right, you know, the land acknowledgement is an important piece, but it can't be the last piece. And, and I think what, what I saw growing out of Intertribal was a very clear plan of, of what these other pieces needed to be. So I completely agree. Listening to the, the students is absolutely crucial and will give us so much more depth. All right. Christina, I have let you rest up a little bit. We, we have a, a, a meaty question from the audience that I am gonna read. It is directed towards you. It's also in the chat box if you wanna read along. Initially, per the constitution, only the federal government had the power to regulate commerce with tribes. But since 1871, They've tried to abdicate this by removing the necessity of negotiation through treaties. From your point of view, what is the appropriate position of Native Americans in relation to the federal and state governments? And how can this work across the 560 federally recognized and many more unrecognized individual entities? And how can this work? Sorry, I put the emphasis somewhere the wrong place. How can this work across the 560 federally recognized and many more unrecognized individual entities? Thank you. Great question. If you find out the answer, let me know. Um, but <laughs> I'll just give you some thoughts. I think, um, you know, really tribes need to be treated and need to act like co-equals to the federal and state governments. Um, I know that under the constitution, that's not technically the case, but you know, if the idea is, you know, that that the federal government was established post tribes, I mean, I don't know how you do it any differently. Um, part of this though, and this is the challenge in California too, is that like, 
our tribal nations don't always agree and they shouldn't honestly because they have their own you know inherent needs and priorities but um don't always agree on who gets to be treated um as governments and whose things are valid and whose aren't um and so i think in practice doing that is really complicated and that's why the federal government and the state um a lot of times we'll work with consortia so that you can get consensus you know opportunities things like that i don't know that that's a bad model for tribes to work through um you know to figure out a way that is not a, a nonprofit and is not a lobbying organization but is actually a governmental organization like a congress um to work through these issues um i know too that some uh tribes have per their treaties, they actually have a congressional seat. And I know Cherokee was actually trying to exercise that. I don't know if they did it um, with Kim Teehee. Um, but, you know, our our rights that we've negotiated um, and our pre-existing rights are only as good as our exercise of them. So, you know, to the extent that, that we have um, that seat at the table, then we need to go take it. You know, you can't just sit on your rights or else that's when people start doing shady stuff um and acting like you never had them in the first place so um you know it's kind of like the right to vote it's, it's only as good as your as your exercise of it and you don't get to you know complain on the back end after um you sat on your hands while the a fascist takeover happened <laughs> um so I don't know, these are just like thoughts off the top of my head, but I do think to get back to the actual question and stop um, going on tangents, um, you know, that really um, tribes, states, um, the federal government in a federalist model should all be co-equal and we should figure out a way of collaborative governing that doesn't infringe on the rights of anybody. You know, we're in a reality where you know, it's not just native people here anymore. So we can't act like it is. Um, conversely, it's not just non-native people here either. So they can't act like it is. Um, and the models that non-native people have brought to govern, to, to do environmentalism, to do, you know, building, planning, don't belong here. And so we've got to think about how we can work together to create, you know, cross the, across the board collaborative so solutions that respect everybody's inherent sovereignty and when we're talking about um native nations that's that's also that sovereignty of traditional knowledge that you know predates the united states by millennia so um i think um in an ideal world you don't have tribes celebrating that we got a couple more members of congress you have tribes actually be tr being treated as you know, grown-ups at the table who have actual sovereign interests and are elevating their their constituent needs in a way that you know looks like something that is being taken seriously. More natives everywhere is what I want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think our panelists have have done an excellent job of explaining how important education is in dismantling the erasure and dismantling the the monolith right the uh, the I love that that term was introduced into our conversation. So the next the next question I think is it grows out of how well the panelists have done in, in making that argument. So for for Titan future teachers. Um, how how would you suggest that they can get involved build their their knowledge base when there might not be the the curricular support through the university um and, and i will say one of the things i've been working on with some colleagues is trying to get a native american studies minor an indigenous people's minor we're not sure how we're going to conceptualize it but but it's true when i tally up the courses that are currently on the books at Cal State Fullerton that deal with these these issues, um, they're not. You know, we we don't have many much coursework, and we're. It is one of my primary uh, goals to, to change that. But in the interim, can people share some of the ways that they um, expanded their their knowledge outside of the university for our future teachers out there? Get a job at SCIC. <laughs> I, I honestly, um, I, I didn't know I was American Indian until 2000, 
And my dad, is a, who was 100%, never talked about it. And uh, one day he just came to us and said, um, I enrolled you. And okay. <laughs> I had no idea. Me and my two sisters had no idea. And um, then we find out, you know, we have a huge reservation out in Tucson with like three casinos. And it's not like we get money or anything, but um, it, it paid for our education. And as I got a job with Southern California Indian Center, it really uh, helped me understand because I had no idea and the culture and, and you can always reach out to us. We have a, my, my operations manager, Walter Alhady would love to speak on any, you know, on anything. He's, he's pretty much our culture guy here. He, he's, he's Kiowa and um, he's, he loves to speak and talk and, you know, we'll even go, go over there and do a powwow. I mean, just to bring, bring everyone together when, when the time is right. So we're always willing to help and educate, always, always. So just like, I mean, I was just, I'm considered, I'm what they consider an urban Indian. So, <laughs> you know, my buddy right here, he just left, he's, a, he's from Jibwe, you know, and, and he's from uh, Michigan. So, or Milwaukee. He's talking about me, huh? So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so always reach, you can always reach out. We're, we're willing to help and educate. I wrote that down and I think you'll have a lot of takers. Do you happen to have an internship program for students who we have a lot of programs that have internships? Do you take interns? Oh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a volunteer program. You can look us up on Facebook at uh, Southern California Indian Center. And we, we run a food bank. We help out whatever families we can every Thursday. Um, we have my program that's basically based out of LA County. And um, so, we help, you know, women who are from zero to five, but anybody just within help that needs help, we're gonna help. You know, we have a sort of not too big of a, a, a diaper bank, you know, and we help out, especially during this trying time. Thank you, Jen, I saw your mic go off. Would you mind weighing in? Yeah, I wanted to make a point to talk about um, Jackie Nunez, um, who is, um, she's a, another member of a Hushman nation. Um, she uh, works a lot with educators um, in um, teaching our some of our traditional songs and some of and, and just representing she's done a lot of school tours throughout California. Um, I know I don't know if she's doing it as much now but I know in the early 2000s. Yes, um, she, yes. We see her. Um, all the time. We, see Jackie. we see Jackie all the time. Yes, yeah, Jackie. so yeah. I would say Jackie like Jackie, Jackie. reach out to Jackie <laughs> if you want to educate people yes. about SoCal natives. Um, yes. Just, yeah, Jackie. that we'll get we'll, we'll put it, drop her name in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Raina, do you want to contribute to this question about future teachers? Yeah, um, I would say something that would really help um, I guess would be um, getting somebody designated, not like, it doesn't have to be like, like specifically hire a person for this, but like designate somebody to be this connection between intertribal and um, student teachers or, you know, because a lot of the times, yeah, you know, people send us emails and they'll be like, hey, we have this and we have that. And we try to answer to as many emails as we can, but usually it's just one person doing like, all of the um, logistics and all of like the email work. So we can't get to everybody at once. So I would say, uh, you know, hire someone that will actually, yeah, hire someone that will dedicate their time to create these connections between um, the community and the school and, you know, inner tribal and um, the school itself, because at inner tribal, we can only do so much. So it would have been great to have somebody that can like be that connection and that like, you know, um, constant back and forth. Thank you for that suggestion. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go back to our, our pre-scripted questions. I'm gonna choose just one, well, maybe I'll have time for two, but um, let's see, which one do I wanna choose? I'll just go in order. Uh, what do you wish both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party knew about Native American and indigenous communities and civic engagement. Go 
Christina, I saw your mic go off. Do you want to say something here? I'm weighing whether I should say something, given that it's partisan, but I'll say something. I think um, Native issues are not partisan issues, and that's something that when I was in a more um, advocacy-oriented role, um, we emphasized a lot, is that, you know, Native people are voting for their lives. And so they're not voting for people just because they like them. They're voting for people because that's the person who's going to bring water to their communities. That's the person who's going to take COVID seriously. That's the person who's going to take the treaties and sovereignty seriously. Or that's the person who's going to, you know, promote self-determination and self-governance in a way that doesn't infringe on, on tribal economic development or community development. And so, you know, that's what I would say is like, when you are working with native communities, I, if you are, you know, from a party, if you are, you know, trying to get out the vote, if you're trying to run for something, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, it matters how much you care about the people that you're supposed to be caring about. And so, with the native communities, I would just say that go connect with the native community, figure out what their needs are, and then go do that. You know, that's actually made some people's careers um, in Alaska, especially where there's been writing candidates who are now in the Senate. And so, um, you know, I would just say take human issues seriously, take native issues seriously, and then the partisan stuff falls away. Thank you so much. Um, I think after the, does anybody else want to say anything on this issue? I think this will be the last question. Last chance to talk. I just, um, I know, I know Christina I wanted to avoid being nonpartisan, so I will. Um, <laughs> the founders of your institutions both tried to rob us of our culture, our land, and our lives while distilling the bears. Highlights from the Iroquois Confederacy, the democracy you claim to uphold with your help upholds the financial interests of the few while desecrating the land and poisoning the water and continuing to murder our people. You neglect our missing and murdered indigenous women and people for that matter. Whoop, lost, we're at 10% battery. But you neglect those um, and has led to more stolen brothers and sisters with no follow-up or answers. Um, I know more, I know a 20-year-old Diné poet and activist who does more for Native communities than some people in positions um, of elected officials. So our communities can organize, we can provide mutual aid for another, it's what we've always done, but it's not enough. And yes, to echo Christina, we need someone on our sides who is going to believe that COVID is real and that our communities need water and that we need to stop desecration of places like Pavungna on Cal State Long Beach um, campus. Um, we need people with native voices in their mind's eye when they're making their decisions because this entire nation is on native land. Thank you, Raina, Ray. I'd like to add to what Jen said. Um, thank you so much for saying that because, you know, it's really tricky being like in this panel and all that stuff. So I'm, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in the end, we don't really care who it is, the Democrat, Republican, it's all from a government that upholds white supremacy. Um, this whole representation politics is all kind of silly in the end too, because yeah, we may have like natives in policy and government, but in the end, sometimes they end up supporting these policies that are against what is better for the indigenous community, like Jen said. So it's like, you know, like she said, I know people like, you know, that do more community work by taking action rather than, you know, promising like these uh, bills passed or like, um, for like um, a certain indigenous community. So that's what I would want to tell like the two partisan, um, the Democrats and Republicans, you know, it's the same thing. Like we see you as the same thing. We see you as the enemy because we haven't felt like you've supported us as indigenous people. A lot of the, um tribal constitutions need to be changed they because they follow a lot of the of the western you know and we have to align them with better traditional values so when a lot of these tribal constitutions were, were created they took on a lot of the western values 
And so they need to be recreated and educated. That's my take. Thank you so much. Um, I think I now have to wrap up, even though I would love to stay with y'all for the rest of the afternoon, honestly. Um, this has been such a great conversation and I think it's given a lot of direction at least to my college and I think to the university at uh, as a whole of, of what we need to do to promote advocacy, give students the skills to engage um, in civic, you know, to engage civically in these these issues. So thank you for this this first step to a very long road at this university. I think Cecil might want to come in and say some final comments. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap up um, our session today. So I want to thank um, Jessica, Dr. Stearns. I want to thank all our panelists today for sharing um, your stories or perspective and your lived experiences um, with our campus. I um, mean, I think there was a lot of things for us to reflect on and consider how we can take action further to ensure that we're supporting our Native students, our Native faculty and staff here on campus and considering the land that we that um, Cal State Fullerton operates. So thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us today. I also wanna give a special thank you to our partners in alumni engagement and government external relations for helping us um, find um, our panelists and help us run some of the program parts of of, um, our, our chat today. And once again, this chat will be um, posted on the um, Office of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity YouTube channel. So if folks want to go back and rewatch it or share this with folks, um, we'll be able to send that out as soon as it's ready. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank all our attendees for coming today. And please keep a lookout for the future Titan Table Talk series in the spring semester. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, take care and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thank you so much for being here. Take care.